for joining in spite of the difficulties. <laughs> so it's a great pleasure. So are you fine? We can if you can if you are fine, we can start maybe. Uh, we can. However, I don't have the power to share my screen with you. Wait a second. Uh, can you fix this? Uh, it says that only organizers and speakers uh, may share, and I'm not uh, logged in as a speaker. I'm yes, uh, that you should be. Fabio should be able to give you the. Okay. Now it's okay. Say, well, you have a, on the lower part of the screen, you have a bar with yeah, a yeah. camera. Yeah, now you should be able to try. I see that someone fixed this for me. Yeah, thank you. So I'm. And you can either share the whole screen yes, with yours see. or just a single application. Yes, okay. Yes. And, okay. Anyway, that. now it's working. Great. Good. Okay. So, so let me. Uh, yeah, Colangelo, so, go ahead. Okay, maybe I present you even though it's completely useless, and <laughs> then you can start. Okay. <laughs> so it's uh, really. A great pleasure today to have uh, uh, for our first uh, attempt of having a colloquium online uh, Marcelo Viana from IMPA. And uh, so, as I was saying, I mean, there is not much need for a presentation, but uh, let me just mention that he has really bazillion of result on dynamical system and especially a partial hyperbolic dynamical system and hyperbolic dynamical system, strange, strange attractor. He proved the Zoris Konshevich conjecture. He got uh, several prizes, uh, like the Ramanujan Prize, the Grand Prix Scientific de la Fondation de, and uh, he was plenary speaker at ISM, and uh, many other things that, you know, yes, a Wikipedia page, if you want to check, you can look <laughs> over there. There are a lot of information. And, uh, but most of all, he had really a great impact uh, on uh, dynamical system uh, worldwide uh, with uh, his work and uh, also with uh, his activity as a mentor. He had a huge number of students. I think that according to the genealogy project, he has like 83 descendants. So that's quite a big number, I would say. And uh, what uh, uh, beside all this uh, great uh, scientific achievement, he is also really a very, very active organizer. He uh, is director of IMPA, he was uh, uh, vice president of uh, IMU and uh, he president of uh, the Brazilian Mathematical Society. And he has been chair of uh, the uh, last uh, ECM in Rio. Uh, so, uh, yeah, sometimes I really I wonder, I mean, if he lives in a parallel universe in which uh, days have uh, 34 hours. I don't know how you can manage to do all these things. So, in any case, uh, it's really a pleasure to have him, but also because he's always a wonderful speaker. So, uh, even though today we'll be hampered by, you know, the uh, limitation of the, of the uh, system that we are using, but in any case, uh, it's a pleasure to have him uh, uh, speaking about the Japan of Exponent. So, Marcelo, thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Calangelo, for the kind words. Uh, too, too generous. And for the invitation. And thank you all for being here uh, right now. I told Calangelo that I was very happy to accept this invitation, although I felt it was a bad bargain for me because uh, I was wasting an opportunity to visit Roman, uh, Roma in, in, in person. And then he promised that we would fix that in the future uh, once uh, life goes back to uh, some sort of normalcy. And I, I hope we will, he will uh, fulfill that threat that I will be visiting in person. So I, I'm going to... Okay, <laughs> I take your word for it. <laughs> Uh, so I'll be talking about uh, Lyapunov exponents. Uh, it's uh, a subject uh, which is, in a sense, quite old because it started with the work of Lyapunov. It started with the work of Lyapunov uh, at the end of the 19th century. Uh, back then, the the focus was on stability of solutions of differential equations. But starting from the uh, late 50s, early 60s. The, uh, the, the subject kind of moved to a different place in, in mathematics. It moved to ergodic theory once some uh, fundamental theorems were proven. 
And that's where uh, Lyapunov exponents theory uh, nowadays is more uh, fruitful. <clears throat> so let me uh, start at the very beginning, uh, essentially with the, the, the framework that was designed by Furstenberg and, and Keston uh, at the very late uh, 1950s. So we, we consider, uh, this is the simplest possible situation, we consider a certain number of matrices, square invertible matrices D by D, uh, and uh, these are A1 through AN, and we assign to each one of these matrices a probability, the probability that you will pick them, and that's P1 to PN. <clears throat> and the idea is that you are going to pick one of these matrices at random with, uh, according to this probability distribution, and you will do that uh, successively, so you generate a sequence GN of random uh, variables uh, with values in the set of the matrices and the probability distribution given by uh, these uh, weights uh, P1 through Pn. And um, you take this sequence of matrices and you multiply, uh, multiply these matrices. Uh, traditionally, we multiply from right to left, so we get uh, a product Gn, uh, Gn minus 1, etc., G1. Uh, of random matrices with this uh, space of um, values in this probability distribution. And the question that you want to ask, to, to answer is, uh, what can you say about this product uh, when, when the number of factors n goes to infinity? Uh, and the, the, the very, the most basic answer uh, that one can give is in terms of the norm of the matrix and, uh, and the dual notion of co-norm. Uh, so to begin with, we look at these two numbers. The norm is the usual operator norm of a matrix, just the soup of this uh, dilation uh, applied by the, the matrix. And the co-norm is the nth, uh, and it can be expressed in terms of the norm itself, which is the reason why the co-norm is less famous. The co-norm of a matrix is one wow. over the norm of, of its inverse. That That is... Uh, a direct consequence of the definition of the infimum. So the first important theorem in this area was proven by, <coughs> was published by Furstenberg and Keston in 1960, and it says that uh, if you take this, these uh, products of, of random sequences of matrices, then the norm and the co-norm of the product do have a very well-defined behavior. Uh, they have um, uh, exponential rates of growth, that are denoted by lambda plus and lambda minus, and these are numbers, these are deterministic. So for, for almost all choices <coughs> that you make at each step, what you will get as the, the exponential rate of growth for the norm of the, of the co-norm is always the same, are these two numbers, lambda plus and lambda minus, which we call the, the extreme Lyapunov exponents associated to the probability distribution, to so this new, you encodes both the matrices uh, and and the, the weights you assign to these matrices and um, <clears throat> and uh, so lambda plus and lambda minus are functions of this probability distribution and uh, these functions are deterministic they don't get they, you get the same values for almost all choices and uh, since the core norm is obviously smaller uh, or equal than the norm uh, then lambda, lambda minus is less than or, or, or equal uh, lambda plus. So these are called extremo Lyapunov exponents <coughs> of, uh, of the probability distribution. Now, um, the, the question that Furstenberg and Kesson asked in this uh, the paper, the original question was actually not formulated in terms of the norms and co-norms of the matrices. They were initially looking for a corresponding statements about the individual coefficients of the matrices themselves. And, and then re they realized that that cannot be uh, done. There's no such uh, well-defined uh, exponential behavior for coefficients, and they gave counterexamples to that. But they left open the possibility that you could at least say something about the columns or the rows of these matrices. And that was uh, fulfilled a few years later in the next theorem. It is possible to give uh, a, the, 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 the columns of the, these matrices do have a well-defined exponential behavior. More generally, if you fix a vector V, a non-zero vector, 
and you look at the images of this vector by the matrix Gn, Gn minus 1, G1, then um, these vectors have well-defined exponential uh, behavior uh, of their norm and their uh, conorm. That's the content of the next uh, theorem, which was proven by Ocelodex in 1968. The theorem says that there exists uh, D numbers, uh, which are not all uh, distinct. Each one of them comes with a multiplicity. Uh, these numbers are called Lyapunov exponents. Uh, so they are D numbers. D is the dimension of the matrix, such that if you take any, um, <clears throat> any uh, vector V and you calculate its image by the product matrix, then the, the image vector uh, has a well-defined uh, exponential rate of growth, this limit one log of the norm, and uh, these uh, rates, these limits, um, belong to the set lambda 1, lambda d. So, so for each vector v, depending on its position, you get a different rate of growth, And uh, but the, the, the possible results, the possible limits, are finitely many, and they are called um, so the Lyapunov exponents. I said that uh, each m, each lambda j comes with a multiplicity. Um, multiplicity is essentially, cheating only slightly, uh, the the dimension of the space of vectors whose limit is given by that uh, lambda j. And um, <clears throat> and it turns out that the largest one of these numbers, lambda one, coincides with the lambda plus in the previous theorem. And the smallest one, lambda d, coincides with lambda minus. So that's the reason why previously I called lambda plus and lambda minus the um, extremo Lyapunov exponent. Turns out that they are part of this uh, somewhat bigger family of numbers, and they happen to be the largest and smallest uh, elements of that, that family. Okay, so <clears throat> the kind of question that I want to talk about today is um, how do these um, exponents both extremal or non-extremal, depend on the data of the problem. How do they depend on the coefficients of the matrices? How do they depend on the, the probabilities or on the weights? Uh, more specifically, is uh, are lambda plus and lambda minus um, or the other exponents continuous functions of the data? Are they Hilda continuous functions? Are possibly they uh, differentiable? And I will give some answers to at least two of these uh, these questions. Uh, actually, I will give I will mention both positive and negative answers to these questions. <clears throat> uh, this is I, I, I have to make a disclaimer at this point. Um, my uh, the title of this lecture is extremely general. Uh, the theory of Lyapunov exponents is immense. Uh, I looked in Math Sinet, and in the last decade, ten books were pub published about the subject. I published one of them uh, myself in 2014, and uh, I also mentioned two more recent um, books on the subject and, and dozens and dozens of papers. So, of course, despite uh, my title being so uh, general, I will have to uh, focus a lot in, 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 in this lecture. I don't pretend I'm being, uh, doing any sort of survey here, just focusing on some specific uh, topics. Anyway, uh, this is uh, the, the main result. Uh, I will say a little bit about the ingredients of the proof, but this is the main result. And the result is that, um, indeed, the exponents, the Lyapunov exponents, are always continuous functions of the data, are always continuous functions of the coefficients of the matrices and of the weights you assign to, uh, the, uh, to each matrix. And I will, um, in a while, mention uh, a few reasons why this is not an obvious statement. Uh, the proof is actually quite long and not entirely written yet. <coughs> but um, I will also uh, try to convince you uh, that uh, there was no obvious reason at, in the beginning to believe that this would be true, because uh, it turns out that Lyapunov exponents are, are very subtle and very complicated objects to, to control. And uh, it was a little bit of a surprise, at least to me, uh, that one could, could prove such a, a, a general result. So this was is being done by Arthur Avila, Alex Eskin, and myself. But there were uh, <clears throat> predecessors. The first uh, result where I, I was involved was 
the corresponding statement for two by two matrices, which was proven by uh, one of my students, uh, Carlos Bocquet. Uh, then there were um, some extensions. And right now in dimension two, the best uh, result, which is formulated in a very uh, general uh, framework of linear cocycles, was proven by these three young guys, uh, Lucas Bakis, uh, uh, Alex uh, Clark Brown, and uh, Clark Butler, and, and uh, Alex Brown. Uh, I put a, a multiple date, date, uh, date because they finished this paper five years ago, and I think it was just accepted for publication this, this year. Uh, okay. Um, <clears throat> Before I get into explaining what sort of uh, ideas are involved in this, uh, I want to say that, in fact, the theorem uh, that we proved is, is much more general. Um, I mentioned uh, the previous uh, setup, I consider a finite number of, of matrices, each one of, with uh, one uh, with its weight, Pj. There's no reason why you, should, you need to consider uh, probability distributions that are supported only on finitely many matrices. <clears throat> one can, in fact, uh, repeat this theory for in any, uh, you are given any probability distribution in the group of matrices, and the only uh, restriction is that the, the support of this probability distribution is uh, compact. In other words, you don't have to work with only with, with finitely many matrices, you can take any set of matrices that you like, as long as uh, you don't go to infinity, you, you, you bound yourself, you take matrices with bound, bounded norm and bounded co-norm. So that's what I'm saying now, uh, that you can repeat the, this uh, the setup that I presented previously, just re replacing finitely supported uh, probability distributions on the group of matrices by compactly supported probability distributions on the group of matrices. The reason why I didn't want to start with that is that th this raises a little problem. Um, if I want to talk of continuity of a function with respect to the probability distribution, as I did before, well, before it was easy. I just said that the exponents depend continuously on the coefficients of the matrices and on the weights. Now, in order to formulate a corresponding statement, I have to define the um, <clears throat> what is the topology in the space of probability measures. So this is uh, the topology that we want to consider. Two probability measures on the linear group are close. If they are weak star close, weak star close means that uh, they ha they when you integrate functions against new one and against new two, when you integrate continuous functions against new one and new two, you get numbers, uh, integral values that are close to each other. That's a very standard uh, topology in, in measure theory and in ergodic theory. So that's part of the, the, the definition of the topology, but that turns out not to be sufficient here. We also need uh, the supports to be Hausdorff close. Um, Hausdorff close means, uh, those, so the two supports are compact sets. And to say that they are Hausdorff close is to say that each one of them is contained in a small neighborhood of the other. There's some small epsilon such that the support of new one is contained in the epsilon neighborhood of the support of new two, and the support of new two is contained in uh, the epsilon neighborhood of the support of new one. So we actually need the two conditions in the definition of the topology. <clears throat> uh, that was uh, puzzling for a little while, but I will give you an example to explain why topology, this is the natural topology, if you want to work with um, probability measures. And then the, the general statement is that if you view uh, these exponents, lambda 1 through lambda d, as functions of the probability distribution, which is uh, new, which is the data, then uh, this function is, is continuous on the whole space of probability distributions. You can do whatever you want as long as you remain compactly supported and you use this topology. Uh, then you can do uh, anything. That this, these numbers uh, are continuous, very continuously with the probability distribution. But for the purpose of this uh, presentation, if you want to stick with the case where nu is finitely supported, is supported only on a finite set of matrices, then it's perfectly fine. Uh, 
the difference won't show up uh, in this uh, presentation. L let me give you a, a sort of counter example to the theorem, uh, which was uh, actually found by Kiefer in the 1980s uh, to explain, uh, well, it, it, it is meant to do two things. One is to say that, hey, watch out, this is not an obvious theorem. And B, um, the reason why we need this definition of the, the topology is, is explicit here. So here is the example. Uh, I'm going to play with two matrices, A1 and A2. A1 is um, just um, a hyperbolic matrix, um, diagonal. It contracts the horizontal axis by a, a factor of one half and it multiplies the vertical uh, axis by a factor of two. So if I apply this matrix to vectors, if I flip my coin and I get um, A1 and apply it to a vector, what happens is that vectors on the horizontal will be contracted and vectors on the vertical will be expanded at these rates. Now, the other matrix, A2, is the matrix for the rotation of uh, 90 degrees. Um, and sooner or later, as I flip my coin or so I turn the roulette, I will get A2. So sooner or later, uh, when I apply A2 to the vector, the rows of the horizontal and the vertical will be uh, exchanged. So this uh, horizontal vector, which was being contracted very rapidly at, fa at a factor one half, suddenly becomes a vertical vector and vice versa. Uh, so the, if you sit and do a little bit of calculation, you will see that as a result, no vector at all can grow under the action of these two, uh, of this system, of these two matrices, because um, whatever uh, effect the hyperbolic matrix A1 has is eventually killed by the fact that A2 just switches the roles of the horizontal and uh, the vertical. So as a result, uh, the two Lyapunov exponents, lambda minus and lambda plus, are zero. With one uh, uh, caveat, um, I said that sooner or later, uh, the uh, you get to use a2 and that is true as long as the probability p2 is positive but if you if you assign a zero probability to a2 well that's essentially the same as saying that you only play with a1 and then everything i i said breaks down then uh, uh, horizontal vectors are expand are contracted and vertical vectors are expanded so as a result, you see that lambda plus will be zero as long as the probability P2 is positive, but it will be log two if the probability is zero. And uh, that is uh, an obvious discontinuity of the function uh, when you vary P2. And, um, <clears throat> but it also corresponds to a situation as you let P2 go to zero, the support of the measure, which was uh, consisted of A1 and A2, suddenly there's a discontinuity of the support and um, uh, this jump of the support is behind the fact that the exponent uh, varies discontinuously. And that's why we need this Hausdorff closeness condition uh, in the topology for defining the theorem. In fact, this example kind of discouraged uh, Furstenberg and Kiefer uh, in around 1983 when they studied this. Uh, they kind of convinced them that one could not achieve uh, uh, continuity. And um, well, it's, uh, what our results prove is that, in fact, this is the only thing that could happen and you can kind of uh, bypass it by a, a suitable definition of the topology. Okay, um, <clears throat> so uh, before I, I, I go back to talking about ingredients for behind this, these uh, results, uh, let me mention here, um, uh, very surprising uh, discovery of uh, Ricardo Magnier in, in 1983. Uh, this was presented at his uh, ICN um, lecture in, in Warsaw at the ICN in 1983. He found that if you start with a, an area preserved in diffeomorphism on any surface other than the torus, the torus is a bit special and I won't go into it, 
but for any other surface, if you start with an area preserving diffeomorphism, then you can preserve, you can modify that diffeomorphism only slightly uh, in the C1 topology. So after perturbation, you get a diffeomorphism that which is close to the original one, uniformly close, and the derivatives are also uniformly close. But you can do this uh, in such a way as to kill the Lyapunov experiment. So in such a way that after perturbation, sorry, that in the formula that should be G, not F. After perturbation, the derivative of G has no growth at all. The, both the norm and the co-norm have no exponential growth at all. So in this setting, what this theorem says is that by arbitrarily small perturbations, you can kill the Lyapunov exponents. You can make them become zero. And this suggests a very, very uh, discontinuous uh, behavior for the exponents as functions, in this case, as functions of the diffeomorphism. Uh, densely, the exponents uh, vanish. Uh, so <clears throat> it, it suggests a completely different behavior from the one of the theorem that I mentioned previously. And uh, it's still um, trying to put these two very extreme forms of behavior together is still part of the things that we are trying to do nowadays. So how do you put, uh, you know, include these two forms of behavior in the same consistent picture? And there are some, some interesting ideas, um, some progress in this direction. Okay, uh, so this was uh, to convince you that the theorem is by no means uh, obvious or, or even um, to be expected. Uh, uh, there's some level of surprise in the statement. Well, this uh, Manye Bokhi result, oh yeah, this was, as I said, stated by Manye in 1983, but he died before uh, writing a complete proof, uh, and then the, the proof was completed by Jairo Bokhi much uh, several years later, and uh, we extended this to, uh, to arbitrary dimension, to volume preserving, symplectic diffeomorphisms in any dimension. Anyway, go, let me go back to, <clears throat> to our setting. Uh, how do you analyze Lyapunov exponents for this problem where you're picking matrices at random and multiplying them? <clears throat> and the idea is that you formulate uh, your problem in terms of uh, random walk in projective space. Uh, you could do it in, in the linear space RD, but uh, projective space is, is nicer because it's compact. So for each line, for each element of projective space, you just consider the random walk, which uh, is defined by applying the matrix to this line. And you do this uh, successively. So the first time you apply matrix G1, and then your line goes to G1 of X, and then you apply G2, etc. And since uh, the choices of these Gs are uh, random, this gives you uh, a random walk <coughs> on the projective space. Um, the, the image G1 of X is not really a point uh, because G1 is a random variable, so G1 of X is, is, is also a random variable with values in projective space, or if you prefer, G1 of X is a set that carries a certain probability uh, measure induced uh, from the choice of, of G1, etc. The <clears throat> analytical object that you use to uh, to study uh, the random walk, and this is very uh, general basic stuff uh, from <coughs> uh, stochastic processes, is the Markov operator, which uh, is defined on bounded functions in projective space, and this is defined by this formula. Given a function phi, what you do is that you apply, you calculate it on the uh, all possible values of gx, and then you integrate over your choice of, uh, of the matrix G. It's the average of phi over the image of x, where you average out with respect to the choices of uh, the matrices. <clears throat> then a probability measure on projective space is, is said to be mu stationary if um, if it sat satisfies this uh, this relation, what what this relation means, if you want to visualize it, is think of a, a projective space with a certain probability distribution in it. Move it around by the by applying your matrices. There are plenty of matrices. Each one does 
its effect, then you average that out. So you started with the measure, this, uh, uh, some mass distribution in projected space. You iterate under all these matrices, take the average, and to be stationary uh, means that what you get at the end is precisely the same thing that you started with. Uh, this is is like uh, the notion of invariant measure in more indeterministic dynamical systems. But what I want to emphasize is that you can understand lots of things about the random walk from uh, these uh, stationary measures. <clears throat> they they kind of encode uh, how trajectories in the random walk behave, at least at the statistical level. And here is one concrete and important uh, fact. Stationary measures uh, determine the Lie Aponev exponents. If you know the stationary measures for the random walk, then you know uh, the Lie Aponev exponents. Uh, and this is um, this statement uh, on the screen is uh, often called the Furstenberg formula. It was, it was proven by Furstenberg in 1963. Uh, you, you don't have to look at the, you know, the record to memorize the details of the formula. It doesn't really matter. Uh, what matters is that there is an explicit formula for lambda plus of mu for the largest Lyapunov exponent uh, given as a supremum of something. This something is, is rather explicit, is the integral of a certain function, phi. This is called a dilation function. It's the integral. The integral is taken with respect to the measure mu in terms of uh, the choice of your matrix. And then you also integrate the other variable, v, uh, with respect to all measures. And you get uh, kind of a closed formula for lambda plus of mu. It's, it's not completely closed because it's a supremum over a set, over the set of all mu stationary measures, which is not a, such a simple set to understand. But still, immediately from, from this, or more or less immediately from this, there are conclusions that you may uh, extract. Um, for example, the fact that this is a supremum tells you that the, Lyapunov, the largest Lyapunov exponent, lambda plus of mu, is an upper semi-continuous function of the measure. So you are, you are after proving continuity, an upper semi-continuity uh, essentially, comes essentially for free, if you are given the Furstenberg formula. It's a supremum, and the supremum of things, supremum of continuous things is upper semi-continuous. If you don't recall what upper semi-continuous is, uh, which we tend to forget, it, it means that if the function has a certain value uh, at a point, by changing slightly the point, it may decrease suddenly, but it, it cannot explode. It may become much smaller, but not much bigger. Um, so I will focus here on, on lambda plus. There's a corresponding statement for lambda minus, where instead of upper semi-continuity, you get lower semi-continuity. Uh, but I will focus on this. And then <clears throat> if you have a function which is uh, upper semi-continuous, uh, semi you are sort of halfway into proving that it is continuous. And let me uh, walk you through uh, that halfway. Take a sequence uh, mu k uh, of measures converging to mu. You would like to prove that lambda plus of mu k converges to lambda plus of mu. First of all, uh, you may always choose uh, stationary measures that realize the lambda plus. I said it was a supremum, it's actually a maximum. The supremum is attained. So for each k, there exists some uh, eta k for which this is an identity. Lambda plus of mu k is the, is the integral of phi um, given by this expression. You, go, you may go to the limit as k goes to infinity. When you take the limit for eta k, you get some measure eta. There's compactness that ensures that the limit exists, or at least an accumulation point exists. And then uh, this integral uh, converges to this. So the the, the integral of phi with this, for, for k, uh, it converges to the integral of phi for the limit. Uh, besides, there's a, a, a little lemma saying that the measure eta that you obtain as the limit is necessarily stationary for the limit measure. So this is all completely uh, elementary. Uh, so there are two possibilities. 
in this convergence, in this formula here, the left-hand side is lambda plus of mu k. It may be that the right-hand side, that the limit is also lambda plus of, of mu, or maybe it isn't. So there are two possibilities. If the right-hand side coincides with lambda plus of mu, then you proved continuity. The other possibility in view of, uh, of, uh, of the fact that it's the supremum is that, in fact, the right-hand side is less than lambda plus of mu. And in this case, you only get upper semi-continuity. It corresponds to what I said, that you may degree suddenly, but it just cannot explode. Okay, so this is um, basically the situation. This, uh, the, all this was known uh, back in the 1980s <coughs> and even before that. And it, um, it isolates your enemy is this possibility that you know, when you go to the limit, you get something that is strictly smaller than lambda plus of mu. So here is a, a fact that was discovered uh, by several people, uh, at least by first and Kiefer in 1983 and also by Enyon in 1984. Uh, they proved, let me go back to the previous slide. We are talking about this very last possibility, the very last line uh, here, the, our enemy. What they proved is that if that happens, if the integral that you obtain is strictly smaller than lambda plus, then the, the system has to have a, a certain structure. Um, in particular, there has to exist some vector subspace of Rd with uh, a few strange properties. The first one is that this uh, subspace E is invariant under all the matrices uh, in the support of mu. Okay, this, let me stress, this is a very strange condition. It means that there's a, an eigenspace which is common to all the matrices that you are considering. There is some subspace which is invariant by all of the matrices. Matrices have very few uh, invariant subspaces. I mean, if you have a two by two matrix, at most, if it's not the identity, then you have at most two invariant subspaces, uh, the eigenspaces. To have several uh, matrices agree on, on sharing one common eigenspace, it's very unusual, okay? So this is very non-generic. The second possibility is, uh, the second fact, is that this uh, subspace E, uh, we, we ended up calling it the equator, is relatively contracting. What that means is that if you take vectors V along the equator, they, their, their orbits grow at a small rate, smaller than lambda plus of mu. But if you take vectors outside of E, then all of the vectors that are not in this special subspace, e, they uh, grow at the maximum possible rate, lambda plus. So E is like a, a contracting eigenspace. It's kind of associated to, um, to eigenvalues that are smaller than the maximum. That's, that's the idea. If you have, for example, Perron Fabinius uh, theory in your, in your mind, this is uh, the, the space where the eigen space, the eigen uh, values are, are small. But I mean, this is not, this is more complicated. A and then the third condition, uh, the third property of E is that this limit measure eta that we obtain, this mu stationary measure that we obtain has to give positive weight to E. And that's the final condition. Okay, so the, the E is, is significant, is relevant for the stationary measure eta. So the way we prove, uh, I would like to tell you that uh, we proved the theorem by saying that one, two, and three are incompatible with each other. Unfortunately, they are perfectly compatible. It's easy to find examples of this, and I will give you one. Uh, the actual strategy is more subtle than that, is to prove that the three of them put together are incompatible with the fact that you obtained eta as the limit of stationary measures for nearby uh, probability distributions mu k. Okay? Uh, this can exist, 
but such stationary measures cannot be uh, accessed from from uh, perturbations. They cannot be obtained from perturbations, and that's why this cannot actually happen because going back to the previous slide, uh, eta was a limit. Eta was a limit of eta case. So being a limit, it doesn't have the right, it cannot have these three properties together. <clears throat> okay, um, so let me give you here an example. Uh, it's a very, very simple example. It's, it's probably the simplest example where continuity of the Lyapunov exponents was unknown when we started. Uh, you, you just take two matrices, and th this time both matrices are uh, diagonal matrices. Um, A1 is, uh, has eigenvalues 3 and 1 third, and A2 uh, eigenvalues 2 and, and 1 half, but they, the behaviors are uh, opposite. Uh, A1 contracts the horizontal axis, and A2 expands the horizontal axis. They, they, they switch the kind of uh, contraction and expanding behavior. So, if you take, say, a horizontal vector, uh, it is contracted by one third each time you apply A1, and it is expanded by two each time you apply uh, A2. And since I chose the weights of the two matrices to be the same, to be one half, uh, you will get uh, the two kinds of possibilities 50-50% uh, of the time. Uh, A1, 50% of the time, A2, 50% of the time. However, A1 has is stronger. The, the contraction along the uh, horizontal axis is one third, whereas the expansion you get from A2 is only is only two. So on average, vectors that are along the horizontal axis will be contracted, like by square root of two thirds or something like that. And of course, you have exactly the opposite behavior for vertical vectors. So in this example, A2 is the, um, the equator. It is invariant by both matrices. It is uh, relatively contracting because uh, vectors that are horizontal get contracted at this square root of two thirds uh, rate. And all other vectors uh, pick up behavior from the vertical and get uh, to be expanded. So in this example, there is an equator and it is very easy to find uh, stationary measures, namely the Dirac mass on the uh, horizontal axis that are stationary and um, so satisfy all three conditions in the, the previous uh, previous theorem. Uh, and this is, was also the kind of example that discouraged Furstenberg and Kiefer when they, they worked on this. So uh, at this point I will start waving my hands. So you, you may have an equator, okay, but um, what now you look at the random walk what, how does the random walk behave near this equator? Well, the, the vectors along the equator are relatively contracted. Vectors that are outside are um, expanded faster. So the, the net effect of, of the very definition of relatively contracting is that the equator is a repeller for the random walk. If you, if you take any line, any element of projective space that is near the equator, its, uh, its horizontal component will get contracted, the vertical component will get expanded, and that means that the random walk will tend to diffuse, to send all other um, nearby uh, elements of projective space, all other lines far away from the equator. And this was the key uh, intuition. Uh, if such a space E exists, then it is a repeller for the random walk. The heuristics is the, the hope uh, was that um, for nearby random walks, which means for probability measures, uh, probability distributions in the linear group mu k uh, close to mu, um, the trajectories of the random walk should run away from the equator. And so statistically, they should spend a very small fraction of time near uh, the equator. The random walk is random, it will take you anywhere. But if you're looking statistically, what you want to know, uh, how, how much time you will spend in different parts of the projective space, and in particular in the neighborhood of the equator. 
And the fact that the equator is such a is, is a repeller should mean that points uh, actually spend very little time there. And, uh, and that's what we actually are able to prove that uh, because uh, of this behavior, the repeller E um, has very small weight, very small, meaning that the trajectories of the random walk for a uh, probability distribution in UK spend very little time near the repeller because they don't like the repeller. And, and then as a consequence in the limits, whatever limit you, you get as stationary measure for the limit is uh, actually gives zero weight to uh, the equator. And that's, uh, I'm, I'm going back here. Uh, so logically we say, if this situation happens and you have an invariant relatively contracting subspace, this subspace is, will be a, a repeller for the random walk, and thus it will have to have zero weight for every stationary measure that comes uh, as a limit of uh, any stationary measure eta that is a limit of eta k. Okay, this is um, the strategy. Sorry, uh, Marcelo. So I don't understand. Do you use explicitly the fact that this mu k realizes the soup of the the upper of exponent in the approximating, or or is just for any invariant measure that uh, you get uh, this fact? This is true in general. Uh, I use it uh, here. I mean, the fact that it's realized the soup was was used here, but not not anymore. No, not anymore. If you you take the perturbed uh, random walk, any uh, stationary measure for the perturbed random walk cannot um, approach uh, will as as the, as the limit. It will be uh, it will give zero weight for <coughs> for this uh, repeller. Okay, so there's a kind of a it's a kind of analysis of the dynamics of uh, well, at least this special type of random walk. Okay, so <clears throat> the limit has zero measure. Now, one problem, and this will be uh, essentially the last observation I'm going to make about the proof, uh, is um, how do you turn this idea into uh, something that you can actually prove? And when we did it first with uh, in, in dimension two with Carlos Bocher, uh, we did this uh, by hand. We uh, just Cal did calculations with um, with the random walk discretized. Uh, this is a random walk in continuous space. We discretized and uh, and did calculations. It was a little bit painful, uh, but then um, in in the collaboration with Arthur and and Alex, uh, we came up with a uh, with a different, a much more conceptual strategy. So let me finish by telling you what is this uh, ingredient <coughs> and the idea is um, to use uh, a notion uh, that uh, Alex calls a Margulis function. This, this was I can kind of, I think, rediscovered by several people, but it goes back to Margulis, to a paper of uh, Askin, Margulis, and, uh, and collaborators. Uh, and it goes like this. Uh, I will just formulate a simple um, statement to, to explain why this is a useful notion. You, you you decompose your projective space, or in general your phase space, into two disjoint subsets, A and B. And suppose that you are able to find a function in projective space, psi, um, with the following property. When you apply the this Markov operator to psi on the set A, the Markov operator decreases the function. And when you apply it uh, on, on the complement, it doesn't increase the function too much. Okay, so to help you connect the two things in the function that I have in mind would be the distance between two points. And if I'm near the equator, or rather the logarithm of the distance or minus the logarithm of the distance, when I'm near the equator, the action of the run of the equator being a a repeller, the action of the, the, the random walk is to increase the uh, distance. So the logarithm increases, and so a minus logarithm decreases. That's the set A. A would be the neighborhood of the equator, and this behavior, this uh, 
repelling behavior near the equator corresponds to, gives us the first line here. Okay, this dynamically means, it is, I mean, this is an abstract statement, but dynamically is meant to uh, correspond in the application to this uh, repelling behavior near the equator. So here is a little lemma. The uh, proof is a two lines calculation. If you have such a, if you are able to find such a function with a finite integral, then any stationary measure, any stationary measure has to satisfy this inequality. And what this inequality says is that the weight of A cannot be very big. So the region where the, uh, your function is decreased by the, the, the random dynamics, the reason, region where this occurs cannot be, uh, have a, a very big weight for any stationary measure. In the application, as I said, a would correspond to a neighborhood of the equator. Uh, psi is uh, like the minus logarithm of the distance. And this statement says <coughs> that um, that region where you notice this hyperbolic behavior cannot be very big in terms of the weight that the stationary measure gives uh, to it. And when you, you, you formulate this with the suitable epsilons and deltas, this gives you the kind of upper bound to conclude that in the limit, um, the eta of E has to be zero. Okay, so this uh, is a very uh, dishonest summary of the proof. Uh, the proof is very long. Uh, it's already quite long in dimension two in higher dimensions is, uh, is, is really long. And, and most of the, uh, the work, uh, in fact, consists of constructing a Margulis function um, for a not exactly the Markov operator that I mentioned, I and mean, you have to do all the nitty-gritty uh, adaptations to, to the problem, but that's, um, <clears throat> that's a fair, uh, just a glimpse of uh, the, the strategy, and also of the fact that uh, uh, this, there's a bit of uh, technology that was developed, um, especially by Furstenberg and his, uh, his collaborators, uh, but the uh, the new things are mostly uh, dynamical systems intuition uh, applied to uh, random uh, stochastic uh, setting, but it's 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 essentially dynamical systems intuition. Okay, I, I am going, going to stop here. There were a few slides left, but I, I'm looking at the screen. One advantage of technology is that you have a clock in front of you, so I know I already exhausted your patience and I stop here. Thank you very much for your attention. Maybe I, I can just ask a very quick question since I'm abusing of my position. Uh, you say that you have to modify the operator, uh, the Markov operator P. So can you just say one word about what the problem is, why it must be modified and, or something? I mean, just yeah. some vague idea. Sure, sure. Uh, it's actually quite simple. Uh, this, uh, the, the, uh, the equator is a repellent. So if you do the calculations near the, uh, the equator, even in, in dimension two, you do get this kind of, um, of behavior that you need for uh, <clears throat> the Margulis ty function type of behavior. However, that is obviously local. You are not going to get that uh, far away from the equator. You are in a compact space to begin with, okay? So you have to localize your analysis to some small neighborhood of the equator. And that neighborhood is not invariant. Your matrices don't, uh, are not constrained to, to, it's not invariant under the random walk. You, you have motions going out of the, the neighborhood and going inside. So you have to account for that. You, you have to use a localized Markov operator just that only looks at that uh, neighborhood. But then of course you have to pay the price for this uh, technical motions from uh, in and out. Uh, they balance each other because that's what stationary measures do. They, they, they are stationary, they balance each other. But uh, uh, so that's already an issue in dimension two. 
in higher dimensions, uh, there's something worse. Uh, if you if you never thought about it, it's not so easy to explain. But uh, think in dimension three. Uh, then the the ambient space is um, is like a sphere. It's a uh, RP two. Um, the equator. Think of the equator as being just a, the, the circle. Um, when you take points approaching the equator, I mean, the equator is only normally uh, repelling. It's, it doesn't have to be repelling along the direction of the equator. So mm -hmm. if you take two points that approach the equator, but they do that by being essentially uh, uh, horizontally aligned, they won't experience any uh, expansion because along the equator, there's no expansion at all. The expansion is only uh, transversely to the equator. So that involves a much more delicate um, change of the Markov operator, and we have to go to um, relatively weird spaces, um, uh, flag spaces and stuff like that to, uh, to make it work. It's still the same uh, intuition, but it's a lot more delicate to find the proper formulation. I see. So there is some, someone that wants to ask some question? Uh, maybe... Uh... So, thank you very much for the very nice talk. I just have a curiosity. Um, so here you work with matrices uh, whose entries uh, are numbers. Can you do something when uh, the entries are maybe in some ring or maybe some modules like, uh, I don't know, functions or uh, 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 forms or whatever? Well, the, the honest answer is that I didn't think about it, um, <clears throat> but um, let, let me put it this way. It, it's not desperate. Uh, one, I mean, uh, to, to give you a serious answer, I would have to think. Uh, but, for example, this goes directly from real numbers to complex numbers without uh, mm. a blink of the eye. Um, and uh, so it's quite plausible that uh, if you have you need some, um, what was it called? The notion of norm has a role here, so you need uh, that sort of structure. But otherwise, it could, the structure of uh, the reals is not so important in this, uh, or, or the complex is not so important in this theory. But uh, as I said, uh, to make it, uh, in, to turn this into a serious, uh, honest answer, I, I would have to think a little bit more than 15 seconds. Okay, thank you. Sorry, there are not. For the uh, uh, um, of for local um, fields also. Sorry, I couldn't hear so well. Could you please? Uh, the sound was not so fantastic. Could you please repeat? I mean, uh, there is a, re a result of Raganathan uh, uh, multiplicative. Oh, oh, sorry, subjective ergodic theorem. So I think uh, there are the results for the local fields. I'm afraid my fellow froze. Something went wrong. I think he lost the connection. Yeah, the connection collapsed apparently. Well, I don't know. Maybe it's a sign of internet that we overstayed our welcome. I don't know. Okay, maybe now it's coming back, I guess.
No. Ok. So, <laughs> so it seems that the uh, internet decided that uh, the seminar is finished, apparently. What can I say? <laughs> yeah. 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 Whatever. Well, it was nice till it uh, till it lasted. So but anyhow, we were. Uh, we we cannot thank the the speaker again. We cannot speak. Thank the speaker. Okay. Okay. So maybe we can. Uh...